Thank you, Marcus, for always a lovely introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Daniel. I, as Marcus said, I'm the professional service engineer for Jamf. I'm based out of the office here in Sydney. I cover Asia Pacific, hence that kind of travel, because you may know Australia is a long way from everywhere. Um, my sort of role with Jamf, just to give you a little bit of background for those who don't know me, I do jump starts, migrations, so people go from on-prem to cloud do custom and expanded services, so integrating with other tools that you might have, like uh, an asset database, and you need to automate something, or you need to have a script to respond back for user's input, that kind of thing. I generally try and avoid doing too much customization, because then it has to go through to support, and support look at what I did, and they just hang up the phone. <laughs> no, support never do that. Um, so. All of the things I'm going to do, this is going to be, this is going to have a live demo type thing to it. I have made a sacrifice to the demo gods this morning, uh, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'll put this link up at the end as well. So all the source code that I'm going to use and the keynote slide deck of all 11 slides will be available on that link. So this is sort of like a little scenario about what I'm going to cover with you here today. So I'm going to sort of go through a what's a webhook. I'm going to use PHP as sort of a front end to cover like how we upload something to then leverage what the webhook will be communicating to, and give, I've got a specific scenario about why we would do this, and then Morpheus is gonna tell me to show me. So, what's a webhook? I really wanted to try and get Ralph's audio to say what's a diorama. But, um, so, it's a HTTP post. So it's like very much similar to our events API. So. If we think about with a standard traditional API, like the Jamf REST API, it, it is a basis of a request and response. So you'll submit and you'll get a feedback. You might be like, you might be just doing a get, but you still had to initiate something to then get your XML. Or you've set a post and then you get the feedback from the server. There's always something that you've initiated. You could automate that with your server or something like that, but there is still like a send and receive. A webhook server, or a webhook, is sort of like always listening. It's the event, so an event occurred somewhere. You didn't have to make a request. It just, this happened and it's, done, it's been told to do something. So if you imagine you're uh, a business owner, you're starting up a new gym. Now, you're a busy guy, you can't be there 24 seven, so you're looking at hiring an assistant. You've got two people that apply. You've got uh, Mr. Adam P. Isaacs, API. Right? And you have another one, you have Webster Hook, or Webhook. All right? Anyone fallen asleep yet? Uh, so you proceed to a scenario to them both. You say, okay, I want to know, how would you provide to me how many people have applied? How many people have signed up? How is my business going? Is it successful? You know, have I done the wrong thing? Should I have made a cafe? So Mr. Isaacs is a very effective assistant. So every time you, the boss, calls up, he just gives you the list. It's like, you're asking how many did we do today? We did exactly this. Great. Mr. Hook, however, he operates a little differently. The second someone signs up, day or night, doesn't matter, Mr. Hook then just sends you an email saying, hey, this guy just signed up. His name's John Smith. He signed up for this package. His contact details are this. Now, that's great. You both, you, in both scenarios, you got the information, but it was you didn't actually request that at that stage, you just got it then and there. So it was more live, up to date, whereas when you're calling up Mr. Isaacs, you have to remember to call up Mr. Isaacs. So who would you hire? I'd hire both. I'd get Mr. Hook to watch Mr. Isaacs. So now if we change this to be in a different sort of scenario, I'm gonna be using like a webhook server, but I'm gonna have a PHP front end. So as part of this, I could have done this with Python, as I've explained to Duncan, but I wanted to have something as a visual UI, and you can't really do that with what I was gonna originally do in AWS. There, there should have been some audio. Cause I'm TNT, I'm PHP. dynamite. TNT, and I will not fight. TNT. 
I made sure just to cut it all so it wasn't the whole thing. I've also kind of hoped that that song is just now stuck in your head. So when you walk away from this, like, oh, how was it? Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, T and T. Yeah. So PHP is primarily a scripting, a server-side scripting language. It's, uh, yeah, I'm not going to read the stuff up in there, but it's a great sort of thing about having a server-to-server -server communication. It is, it sounds scary, and I've seen people say, oh, I would never touch that, I, I don't know that. It's, it's actually pretty reasonably easy to follow, uh, especially if you've done any bash scripting. You'll find there's a lot of similarities with it. Um, the reason why I went with PHP as well is because I wanted to be a, like a web front end, so I can embed into HTML, and PHP can contact and communicate with over 20 types of databases. So the scenario I'm going to use is a MySQL database, because I work for Jamf. I like MySQL. I'm comfortable with MySQL. But in your organization, you might be using Microsoft SQL, or SQLite, or if you're, or even LDAP. All right, these are all types of databases, and PHP has framework to actually communicate to them all. It's kind of cool, in a very nerdy way. Uh, to find some more information about like learning and what I did to where I went to find more information about this, there's a great website called ww 3 or w3schools.com. It's got loads of information on MySQL, JavaScript, CSS, and PHP. So you'll, if you've gone to that site, you might see some of the source code from there. But it's a really great resource. So this is the scenario I had. Got an organization that's got thousands of devices. And it's a mixture. Like they're Mac OS, iOS, TV OS. And they're everywhere. Some are DEP, some are user initiated, some are people running a quick app package. So I, I've got just, they're everywhere and they're all these different types of enrollment. I need to assign some information to them. Now, I can't upload data to Jamf before the device is already there. Because Jamf uses the unique identifier, the UDID, to determine the device. Whereas other vendors may just use the straight serial number. The reason why we use the UDID is it's very easy to spoof a serial number. And you'll see later on, I've got a two, serv uh, two laptops in my Jamf server that are the exact same serial number, but different UDIDs. But the problem is you can't get the UDID until after you've enrolled. So trying to pre-populate that data is not really something you can do. So I had to find a way of like, okay, when the device hits the server, I need the information from somewhere to be fed into it. Now, most people will think, okay, maybe LDAP, but you can't sign in with LDAP for an Apple TV. Maybe the devices are shared, so you don't want LDAP in that. Maybe you don't need to assign user information. Maybe it's just asset tag. Maybe it's some um, extension attribute fields. It's really up to you. So the example I had was it was an organization where it's cloud, they went Jamf Cloud, they didn't want to talk to LDAP. They couldn't rely on the users signing in with LDAP, and they had a mixture of devices. Well, that wasn't going to solve their entire problem. They did have some poor person, though, that was willing to make a CSV of all these different fields, sourcing this information from everywhere. As long as I didn't have to do it, I was okay with it. He just wanted somewhere he could upload the CSV. It's like, okay, let's see what we can do. So, let's see what we can do. Now, uh, what I'll do, so I do have a server in AWS. Can everyone see this okay? Yes? Cool. So it's just running Ubuntu 16, and I am going to cheat, and I do have this type of thing. You don't necessarily need to read this, it's just me copying and pasting the line so I don't have to forget stuff. So. I'm going to assume that uh, for my fields for my CSV, I'm going to have serial number, because I can get the serial number and get that out of DEP. Your reseller should be able to provide that for you. That's at least one piece of information I know I can get. I'm going to uh, update to an asset tag, username, position, uh, email, full name. Those are the fields I'm just going to work with. But you could change these fields to be something more fitting for your organization. So let's see how well our internet works here. This is completely clean server, so I'm really tempting the demo gods. <laughs> so I'll install MySQL. This will go through. We have a nice secure password. Who can guess what it was? There we go. <laughs> I should have brought swag, actually. I could have done questions. So 
ran this run through, and this was what I was worried about, was like how often would the installs hang? So I'll sign into MySQL by typing properly. And I did say typing properly, didn't I? There we go. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a database. I'm just gonna call it assets. I'm going to then create a user with the password. So user is asset at localhost, and the password is just xworld2018. If you've ever done a Jamf on-prem install, this would be very familiar to you. Then I'm just going to give that account access to that database. With me so far. Now, this line here is where I'm actually going to create the specific table within the database. So if I paste this in here, it might be a little difficult to see. Might move this up a bit as well. So you can see I've got my fields here. So serial number is going to be a variable character, numbers and letters. The length no more than 12. All right. So if someone uploads the serial number and it's got the S in front of it, I don't know if you've ever had to embed it in. The barcode readers always put that S onto it. That was always fun. They try and upload this, I'm not going to get the corrupted thing. I know that my serial numbers are only going to be 12 characters. I don't think Apple's going to change that anytime soon. Now that I've said that out loud, they probably will. I've also then said, okay, asset tag, I've just done variable character, 255 characters. If you have an asset tag that is 255 characters, I want you to rethink your workflow, please. But just for this scenario, I've just made all the fields 255. You say, okay, username, full name, email, position, and the primary key, the identifier, the thing I'm linking all those other rows to is the serial number. So if I like, decide I've got this machine, it's assigned to this user, and I re-upload the data because I need to replace it, as long as the serial number is the same, it will replace that data instead of appending it. And what I'll do is I'm just going to put some demo data in there. Use assets first. One row affected, so you can see I've got like a serial number, an asset tag, and some details there. To make it a little bit easier to see, those are my fields. All right. Or if I say select everything, again, a little hard to see with this. Yeah, I can see the information in there. So that's all well and good. I have a MySQL server with some data in there. Woohoo. Now what? I need to install PHP onto this now so I can have some form of communication between the receiving end into MySQL. So PHP will run with Apache. So I'll install that. And I'll install PHP. I then install a couple of modules for them to integrate with each other. Again, this is all being recorded as well. You can rewatch this and say, well, what the hell was this guy smoking when he thought about doing this? So I'm going to do a PHP MySQL connector. Or MySQL I is a specific one I'm using. Uh, there are over 20 different connectors that PHP supports with databases. It's incredible. And because I'm going to have the Jamf, uh, this server send data back to Jamf, I'm going to install a curl module for PHP. What I'm going to do is restart Apache. And I'm just going to remove the default Ubuntu, hey, it works, hello world, index file. OK, so I'm now in the web directory where you would have your index.html or index.php or anything like that, just var www.html. I'm going to make a database file. Or I'm going to call it dbconfig. And this is where I'm going to actually have my MySQL settings to allow PHP to communicate with MySQL. So I'm going to nano a file. And this is it here. So we see the host, 
Username, I'm defining these as variables on lines three, four, five, six. So the local host of it, the database name, the username, and the password. Yeah? And then defining this as the connection, it's kind of hard to see on that. That says MySQLi. And these are the user variables in that, all in one connection there. And then I'm actually setting it to UTF-8. This specific scenario I had to deal with was in a country that had not always English characters. So these things called double byte characters. If you've ever had to deal with those, you know my pain. So Asian, Asian characters, Japanese, Chinese, that kind of thing, they're generally the big ones there. That's very annoying. So I've had to define my MySQL encoding as UTF-8, so it supports those. And I've just had a check here. So if I can't connect to it, give me an error. So I'll save this. I'll give it the permissions it needs. Okay, if I go to Safari, so xworld at jampro at services, db config, I've got an error. Who knows why? Nope. Something much simpler than that. Password's wrong. I'm living in the past. I did, did that on purpose just so you could see what the error was. You can see it's actually trying to communicate with MySQL and if it failed to give me an error. Let's make this 18, All right, and refresh. Just get a blank page. So it got a successful one. I could probably put some text in there saying, hey, yeah, it works, but I kind of don't want to give people feedback that something's there. So I've got communication now. What I need to do now is I'm going to make a webhook page. And this is where it's going to have a lot more into it. So I'm actually going to copy all of this first, and then I will go through it line by line. Well, maybe not fully line by line, because we only have a certain amount of time. Um, OK, so I'll start at the top. So I'm including this file. I don't actually have to put the username and password into the same file. More secure that way. I could actually have these written off somewhere so it's not actually accessible. I don't like having passwords in somewhere that is a web-facing server. That's global internet. Anyone can hit this right now. Um, now, I'm going to get the Jamf URL as part of my request from the Jamf server. Benefit of that, let's say I have 10 servers that all need to connect to one database, or one asset server. I don't need to have 10 PHP servers. I don't need to have 10 webhook servers like this. I can just have the one, and I will see this Jamf URL, and I know which one to send it back to. Kind of cool? I'm getting a username and password. I'm going to need a username and password, not to hit this server, but to submit data back to Jamf, because you need to authenticate to submit data to our API. So I need to get some information there. So I'm going to include this as part of my webhook request. I'm going to enter in a username and password, and the webhook server is going to grab that and then define it as variables. And this is actually where I just get the, the information from Jamf. JSON, get file context, PHP, input. Because the server hit the page. It's submitted an input. So I've defined JSON as a variable of what that input was. I like making JSON pretty. So I've just gone a JSON decode of the variable JSON. And then I'm actually going to split out. So uh, if you're more familiar with XML, this would be like instead of what I'm doing here, device type, device serial number, device ID, object, event, and the ID, that would be, that's the JSON equivalent of XPath. All right? This, uh, there's a reason why I did this with JSON, is because I could just take that one JSON and have multiple XPath essentials to it. Whereas if I was doing it with XPath, I'd actually have to have multiple, pull down the XML, get that tag, pull down the XML again, get that tag. I don't want to do that. All right? Now I'm doing the request. See, I'm using DB again, because I've read that from the asset DB config page. So that same variable is actually registered in that other page. And I'm selecting all from assets where the serial number equals the serial number I'm receiving. Now when I first did like a, a trial of this, I shared it with a couple of our other uh, team members. I was like, oh, that's so cool. 
So everyone put the URL into their server. And I forgot to have this. So my error log got huge. It's like, that device doesn't exist, that device doesn't exist, that device doesn't exist. Because I only had my device in there. So this is just like a, an error check and exit out. So it's reading the MySQL, and if the serial number doesn't match, it's not there, just exits out. It doesn't bother trying to do anything else. But if it is there, so it's, if you're familiar with bash, it's an if-else statement. If it's empty, don't do it, else, continue on. And this is where I'm actually cycling through with the MySQL command and grabbing it as an array and then parsing the array. So asset tag is the row that matches the asset tag header. These are matching what my database column names were. Mm, sorry. But I've got these as variables. So I've got them from the database. I've grabbed it off the serial number and that. They're all matching up because I made the serial number the primary key. They're all going to match off that serial number. And now I inject it in, and I'm doing another if and else statement. If the device is mobile, I'm going to embed the asset tag into the XML, username, real name, email position. You could grab extra XML data if you wanted to, you know, your extension attribute ones, or if you're doing building or department, make sure you've got the building and departments existed already in the Jam server. Uh, maybe purchasing information, you know, warranty information. All that information is available to be resubmitted through XML through the API. Now, it might be confusing. I was pulling down JSON. Why am I not submitting JSON? I'm going through the classic API, not the universal API. The universal API doesn't support this endpoint yet. And the classic API only supports submitting of XML data. You can read XML or JSON, but you can only submit back in XML. And then I'm grabbing the URL from my extension, and I'm just attaching the path JSS resource, mobile devices, serial number, device serial number. And if it's a computer, basically you're just doing computer XML instead of mobile device XML. Right? If else, because I'm grabbing the type, which was actually submitted as part of the default webhook. So now I've got my XMLs, I've got my URLs, I need to tell Jaff about it. So this big, lovely text. It's got a lot of uh, uh, factors in it for a curl. So there's my URL. I'm doing the authentication with the username and password. True, it's a put. Uh, for this test, I was not verifying SSL because I wasn't sure if I was going to do an on-prem jam server or a cloud. It's 2018, people. Please have a third-party SSL. Just a personal preference. Um, HTTP header, I'm submitting XML. And then there's the output there, which is executing the whole thing. And this I was just having there as a bit of a error checking of the log. All right, so it writes out what the curl output would be so I could actually see that as well. So I'll close that. OK, and it's got permissions there. So what I can do now is I can go to my Jav server. Might make this a bit, oh. Oh, that ain't nice. There we go. So if I go to settings here, you see I've got this thing here, webhooks. All right? You probably like just glossed over it, like, oh, I saw someone talk about that at one point. We go into here, and I have no webhooks. The display name, I'll call this xworld2018. The webhook URL is my xworld.jampro.services slash webhook.php. I should have that actually here. And you'll see here, at the end of it, I've done my question mark, and then there's a variable of equals the value, the HTTPS. Chances are you would have seen something similar to this when you've gone onto other websites. Uh, anyone tracked a parcel on Australia Post? Yeah? If you actually look at the URL that it redirects you to, you'll see that it's actually the same URL, but then a question mark equals, or ID equals, and then your tracking number is there. It's just a redirection of the PHP. So that's what I'm doing there, so that I don't have to worry about hard coding the URL into my webhook server. And I could have maybe a dev server and a prod server, or it could be a school district. And I've got maybe 30, 40, 100 
and I want one big receiver. My authentication. So as I said, my server doesn't need authentication to hit it. I could turn that on, and that's something I'm not going to bother doing, but the Jamf server needs authentication back. So I can put that in here. Next world. Oh, autocorrect, you will be the death of me. <laughs> okay, so this is an account that's already there in the Jamf server. I'm going to submit JSON, and the event that I'm going to use, for the example I'm going to use, I'm going to use an iPad. All right? So I'm going to select, you can see there's a whole bunch of, and you can clone these. You could have all these different events occurring that are all pointing to the same one. My server doesn't care. It's just, it's always listening. Remember Mr. Hook, he's always listening. It's a little creepy. So I'm going to do a push send, but you can see I've got enrolled there, I've got command completed. Push send, this device I'm going to point it to, it could be powered off. I don't need the device to talk to the server. It's an event that's happened on the Jamf server that's triggering this. Now, if it's enrollment complete, then yeah, the device had to talk to it, but that's for something different. So, I'm going to save on this, and if I go back to settings here, just to confirm, yep, Xworld, it's just a standard, I've got made it an API account, it's just got read and update privileges for computers and mobile devices. So if I go to devices here, and I go search, I've got this device here, you see there's no email address, full name, position, or asset tag, completely empty. Now if I've done this right, I can go to management, I can do send a blank push, because a push is sent. All right, if I go back, there's username information. There's my asset tag information. Kind of cool? It's like, oh, okay, that's all well and good. Yeah, there we go. That information is there. But I don't want to sit there dealing with injecting data manually into MySQL. I mean, I could get that wrong, I could get the back ticks wrong, the quotes, what, what the hell? I, you said a CSV, come on, man. So, that's where we go through in a little bit more stuff, and I have cheated a bit on this. So if I go back to my server here, uh, nope. Xworld, there we go. So I have some extra files here. The index file is what the main user will see. So let's put the index on there so you can actually see what I see. So I'm gonna cp index to var www.html, and I'm gonna mod75 var www.html index. So if I go back to Safari now, Make that a little small. <laughs> um, my index file literally is doing another MySQL, but it's a MySQL read of everything. It's got some HTML in there to make some headers, and you can see some buttons there that are going to call some actions that relate to those other pages. I can bring it up. So there's my config file. Everyone can see that okay? If I look at index, I'll make that a little. Wider there. So I'm including the database file again, because I'm doing a read on MySQL. I wanted to give some feedback about if they've uploaded a file or not, so I'm doing some checking to see, is the file a .csv? Because you know, you really need to spell some things out for some users. All this sort of JavaScript and stuff about like, okay, here's my import button, here's my delete button, and you see it's calling an import data PHP file and a delete table PHP file. So these are separating out the commands. So if I wanted to disable something quickly, I could. Um, and if I was trying to test on something, I didn't have to impact on anything else that was functions. Here's my table headers, so serial number, asset tag. I might say like, okay, I want to put that as a hyphen. That's literally just these names here. All right, they don't actually, have, I could say serial number. It doesn't have to match what the MySQL input is. Here I'm doing my query, so I'm selecting anything from assets, and I'm just ordering it by the username. That is 
related to the MySQL command. So that does have to match your column header. And then I'm doing the PHP, small little PHP commands to echo off the row of every single one, to cycle through. And at the end, I'm putting a delete button, which if I right click on this, you see there it's got that question mark. It's, can I do this? I can. Question mark serial number. Similar to, so you know, Oz post tracking type thing. Cool thing with that, I could send that as a curl command. I could look at automating a deletion of this and sanitizing my database as part of an offboarding procedure. Get back out of that. All right, and then at the end, that's just an FL statement. If there's no data in there, there's no data. You, you, you need to do something. But again, this is just presenting this information. I need the, the machine behind it to actually import it. So that's where we're going to import data here. So it's reading the post of that button. So I need to make sure that they've hit the button. And I'm really just doing this. I'm cycling through, I'm getting rid, if you've got a header on your CSV, I'm just getting rid of that. That's just what that does. And I'm cycling through line by line. I'm selecting the serial number off the line zero. So it's got to be the first column. And if it comes back as greater than zero, I'll replace it into, meaning that it already exists. I need to update that information. If it doesn't exist, I'm going to insert. Literally all that is there. And then when it's done, redirect it back to the index page. So they're not like going back and forth and stuff like that. They could get lost. So let's move that across as well. Import. Go back into here. So I can choose a file. And desktop. Where is my text example report here? Kind of see, got a couple extra serial numbers. I'll choose. Hit the import button. Now it's populated that information as well. All right. Make that a little bit bigger. That, that's not easier to see, isn't it? It's not on top. So this is live. So all, I'm, all I have is parsing through a CSV, and that's what PHP is fantastic for, is actually parsing through text. So injecting it into a database, because it's got that database communication, and then using the HTML and PHP functions to then present it to me as a user as well. So I could, like, you know, I'm on a website, I can say, okay, I'm looking for Bob. Well, there's Bob. So what I'll do is I'll just move the other ones across. Delete table and delete row. Charge seven five five far www.html. Do it all. Why not? So if I have a look at what these other ones are, so my delete table. A good fun thing we have in uh, Jamf when we have a salesperson who called, he was like, oh, how do I fix this problem? I say, oh, yeah, drop the database. Or truncate the table. Delete the table. SQL query, running the SQL query, truncate the table. Now that won't work. Well, it doesn't help me there. And then redirect. Let me double check I've done that. This is always the fun little live demos. Uh, delete. Yeah. Now, did I call it asset or assets? Assets. All right, and if I have a look at the delete row one, 
You can see it's slightly different where I'm actually grabbing the serial number as part of that link. You saw that as the question mark equals serial number or serial number equals. Um, that's what that's doing there and then redirecting through. And if we put this back up to that, just to show you here, should be able to hit this. Deletes like that. Or if I say delete all. Delete all, did I type something wrong? Anyway, maybe it's good to not delete all. <laughs> so yeah. I think for a live demo, it went relatively painless. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.